My name is Bean, B-E-A-N. Uh, let's see, I had 46 fights. I think I lost 45 in one draw. For real, about 39 and seven. Who's gonna be third? Well, we started at Main Street Gym and ended up at uh, uh, 79th and Hoover. I think I was the first fighter that went over there because uh, at the time that I went there, we had a fight schedule and everybody thought I was up in training camp, which I was in 79th and Hoover because at the time it was nothing but wrestlers over at that, that gym. The gym was run by a guy named Paul Matty. That's, uh, 78th Street Gym. Paul Matty didn't allow no black in the gym. That's right. He didn't allow no black in the gym out there. Jake, pardon? Yes. Well, you don't know, see? You was big time. I don't know. I was there when I was there. When I was there, I trained in the gym from day from day one. What year? What year? Okay. What year? That gym there when they first opened. When was that? That was in the 50s. When I first heard about it was a guy by the name of Paul Matty, and they were wrestlers there. And I went over there and I saw these guys wrestling. I said, what the hell are they talking about? This isn't a fight gym, this is a wrestling gym or something. Billy Vargas father used to come down there. He's a wrestler, champion wrestler. Count Billy Vargas father used to come in there all the time and see us and talk with us and do a headlock on me. They wanted me to, uh, to go into, uh, into, the, into that game because, as you know, it's a pretty rough sport. It's a very rough sport. I used to be a professional wrestler. That's what I used to do. I went to a wrestling school and started wrestling, and I wrestled for about probably about four or five years, and then I stopped doing that, and I went straight into professional fighting. As a matter of fact, I walked into a gym. Two weeks later, I had my first pro fight. Hey, you remember they didn't lie no black in that gym? I trained in every gym. Every gym has been around here, I trained there. You had the Teamsters Gym with Jerry Query. Used to work quite a bit. You had the Angels Flight. Then you went back to the Main Street. And then Jake Chagru had his gym. Out on Hoover. Gyms somewhat uh, tend to all look and smell alike. It was small, you know, it's not a big gym, although they have two rings there. Stop dropping your right hand when you're dead. Stop dropping it. Stay in your stance. Look, look, Eddie, look that hook, it's right there, hold it. You gotta come with that hook, baby. You're holding it. Hold it. But you got a lot of boxing at Hoover Street Gym. Hoover Street Gym and Main Street and the Seventh and Stanford. You got a lot of boxing down there, and guys will always be there on time and give you a lot of boxing, get you in shape because they didn't have transportation to get downtown. They didn't have the money, you know, the buses. So Main, so 7805 South Hoover was a good gym for most of all the fighters lived in the neighborhood. Look. They didn't allow no black in the gym. It was owned by a guy named Paul Matty. And after, and Jake Giroux took over the gym. And when Jake Giroux took over, black started coming in there. Didn't even know black living in the neighborhood out there. Didn't know black live out around that gym. That was a good, a good gym. It wasn't good figured out. It, uh, it did regular. Or go to the house or, or uh, graduate to a boxing gymnasium. We had a packing there always. I always had a crowd there. I remember uh, going there when Archie Moore trained one afternoon 
and we had a one of those Trinidad uh, steel bands to entertain. A uh, big crowd of people, <clears throat> many uh, famous Los Angeles musicians, friends of Archie Moore, showed up like Buddy Collette and Harry Sweets Addison. Ghetto type gym, you can say this is a ghetto neighborhood, but I'm telling you man, back then, this was the place to be. This was the place to be, man. Well, hitting Armstrong was there, but he wasn't fighting no longer, you know. I saw uh, Sugar Ray Robinson was there. You know, I had a chance to meet Ken Norton, uh, Archie Moore. Matter of fact, when I was uh, 14, 15 years old, we went, uh, I was, um, was taken down to uh, Archie Moore's salt mines, the, uh, his training camp. I grew up in the Hoover Street Gym. All the guys I know here that are much older than I am all know, know me. I grew up in that gym, boxing in that gym. Uh, and I got to box with great boxers like Auburn and Copeland. Uh, oh, just a ton of great fighters they, who worked with me and taught me the art of the sport. Uh. Scrap Iron Johnson, friend of mine. Scrap Iron Johnson's a legend in this gym. S.T. Gordon, he was a legend in this gym. Marty Monroe, who's a legend in this gym. Ken Norton, a legend in this gym. Um, Mike Weaver, man, some of the greatest fighters in the world came through here and cut their teeth right here in this gym. Smoking Joe Frazier came right here in this gym. Muhammad Ali came and trained right here in this gym, man. This gym is full of tradition. Man. I was not staying in the Main Street gym first. I didn't like Main Street, and so one guy told me that they had another gym on 78 in the Hoover. I didn't know who was at during that time. So I, so I started training there. So a guy named um, Jake McGoo, old guy owned the gym. He just took a liking to me. So he said, Scrout, you're trained here. Most all your great fighters trained there. People who came in and out of the town, they, they came there. A few of them went to Main Street, but a lot of them came to Central Nathan Hoover. You had, you had uh, rouseabouts and you had uh, hopefuls and you had uh, whatever, whatever area uh, or era that a person came from, they, they were there. Oh man, what was it like? It was a paradise. I was just a fighter's paradise. From the, from, the, from, the, from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, they had number champions. Uh, it was a fine example. They had a lot, of, a lot of top trainers, a lot of good fighters, and every weight division. I mean, this, just, this was the place to be. You had people hanging out, people talking about boxing, people betting, making bets about boxing, people saying, who, this guy gonna win, that guy gonna win. I mean, the atmosphere was unreal. It was unreal atmosphere, man. It was just, it was, it's something that you'll probably never see again. It's one of those times in history, man, when it's just, when it's all right and it's all good. I'll never forget it. I trained in 57. Oh, it was, uh, it was the maker of, of uh, L.A. for the boxers. We had uh, Archie Moore, Frankie Daniel, Willie B, Boss Man Jones, Eddie Pace, Scrap Iron Johnson, you know, all the greater fighters came here. Hedgeman Lewis, even Adolph Pruitt, one of the great welterweights, he was here. There's a whole lot of older people you'd hang out there too now. When a whole lot of young little cats coming there. The older people get up there and they'd be sitting around talking about the old game, I guess, because something you could do like old fighters back in the old days, even to when I quit fighting, I used to go up to Hoover Street Gym, go by Hoover Street Gym, and I would meet all my old friends there. They'd be right there at Hoover Street Gym. All of them, you know. Even till I hadn't seen him Armstrong after me and him broke up. I haven't seen him in about five or six years. So one day I went by Hoover Street Gym, I heard Ken Rumstrong, Cannonball Green, all the old trainers was there that day. You know, all the old fighters come in. You know, so that's just where you you could go and meet your people there. Aaron Pry, oh man, Aaron Pry. I remember the first time I saw Aaron Pry. One day he walked through the gym. The first thing he said was Hulk time. And when he walked in, everybody stood up and started watching. And he came in with an entourage. See that? See that? That, that type of thing, man. You can you'll never get that back again. It was beautiful. It was already. Uh, you know, we were all like family now. Mondo Rama, you remember Mondo Rama champion? I saw him got to be champion. I saw Raw Raw House, I saw Ken Norton. All these top of fighters come out of that gym. Richard Steele, the one, Richard, uh, the one, uh, 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 
But when we were fighting, he came out of that gym. We all, it was a beautiful gym. It was a family thing, like, you know what I mean? Everybody, everybody was standing at that gym there, everybody was fighting. Everybody was fighting. Everybody going out of town. So doing it, time and change now. Ain't like it used to be. Double up. Double up. Double up. One, two. Throw it! Throw it! My name is Derek Muhammad from Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm a fight trainer, uh, ex-professional fighter, had 25 professional fights. I come, uh, I come from Memphis, Tennessee to Los Angeles back in 1979. First, first gym I went to was Main Street Gym downtown, and they told me about this gym. So I decided to come over and check it out, and I've been here ever since. I was born in East L.A., but I was raised in the South Side. Uh, Watts used to be my neighborhood, you know, the quarter gang. And uh, that's where I started off. And uh, finally, when I finally went to prison in 2019. Well, this is my Rivera. He's still in the boxing business. He, Tommy's not. Tommy's a grandfather. He got white hair now. But Tommy Kearson, Ishmael Rivera, these are the guys that a lot of people haven't heard of. These were the opponents for the big guys coming up. These are the guys that stood in and got the hell knocked out of them uh, to, for, you know, to enhance the reputation of so-called quote-unquote good fighters. These guys were just nondescript, just run-of-the-mill journeyman fighters, but they were tough. They never made a name. They never made no money. Ishmael Rivera is a barber. He's got a good barber shop down on uh, downtown L.A. Yeah, my name is Ismael Rivera. I, I started, in, uh, when I came from Mexico, I started work out with uh, Jay Chegru and uh, Hoover Street Gym, 1968 to 1980. Jake Chegru, the seaman. Jake Chegru was a great man. He's passed away about 20 years ago. Jake Chegru owned the 78 and Hoover Street Gym. And he owned, also owned the Seaside Gym. He owned the Seaside Gym in, in uh, San Pedro. And Jake started Frankie Crawford out and Armando Ramos, and, and, and uh, that's how Jackie McCoy got him. Jake Chigru was a tough old Irishman. Well, he called himself Irish Jake Chigru, but uh, he was actually from Oklahoma. Good man, very good man. He brought up a lot of good fighters, Joe Orbeo, Frankie Crawford, just tons of fighters he had. Jake, Jake was one hell of a guy. He was a real good friend. And he was, he was your, your friend, he'd do anything for you. Now we go back together when I first met Jake was way in the 40s. And uh, he was just a just a stand-up guy. Oh, he was a good guy, a great guy. He's an old-time old name, man. And, um, and uh, yeah, he just put me in with a little fellow I was just boxed up. And I put him in, and I know they're all pros, these guys, you know. So I had, I had good workouts with the guys, you know. Very uh, understandable young man. You know, until you got him riled up, you got him riled up, you know, then you was in trouble. <laughs> if you didn't pay your dues, you couldn't drink. That's one thing. He yeah. <laughs> asked you when you paid up, and you used to tell him, yeah, he said, well, let me go check the book. If you come back and you hadn't paid, you make you put your clothes on and get out to jail. He's a tough man. But everybody liked Jake. Jake was kind hearted, but he just had his way. Oh, he's a nice, very beautiful man. He was a, wasn't a shared. Nah. You know, and rock a, rock a baby chair like that. See him, you know, with a big puro, you know, big cigar. And, uh, you know, always talking, nice talk, say, ask me. You know, he was a very honest guy with his fighters and well respected by people in boxing. He'll live on forever as long as people that are alive that know him, he'll live on. Like Steinler, like Teddy Bentham, like uh, Charlie Goldman, like uh, um, Freddie Brown. Say, go. No, no, who you know, I don't know, just to go. You don't know who, who wanna fight. And just how much, that's it. You wanna pay, they wanna pay something, this, this, and that, okay. No matter who. And then the way it is. You have to be ready like a soldier, they say, like in the army. Just get your gun and let's go. Same, it's the same question. He don't want to know you ask who, to who you wanna fight. Just how much. How much money you go, I said. Sometimes I don't know the name we want to fight. And sometimes I win, you know, I win the fight, but, you know, local fight, you got to knock him out to win the, the decision. 
So you walked in the gym and Shagru put you right into a fight? Each yeah, time. right. Because uh, you know, I was having the fights. Yeah, I've been training uh, Tracy, you know. And uh, I did all the training over here. You know, so I was in shape, you know. So it's okay if he's on the box. And I work out with pros. So he said, you know, he said, I'm going to have my first pro fight in January. About 63. And uh, I went undefeated. I fought for a time in 1965. That was my first loss to Vicente Saldivar from Mexico City. He most uh, was a cut man, you know what I'm saying? He always fake cuts and stuff. One of the best cut men in, in the business, you know what I'm saying? He didn't take care of me in the corner and talk to me about the fight, you know? They, they would discuss it themselves. And then uh, Jake would get inside the ring and then tell me, uh, do this, do that, don't push it, press him a little more, you know, you don't press it hard enough. And I go to the body and then to the head, you know. And then, so I would just then do the thing he told me to. And he would actually slap you in the head, wham. He hit you harder than your opponent hit you. Eche Gru is like my father. He take care of me good and he pay me good. He treat me real good, like profession, like I am. He never owed me one money and always pay me the right money. This why I like him very much and he's, he's a classic man, you know. No, no, we don't need contract with him. Nothing, just go. Jake wasn't, wasn't the type of uh, precious guy. He was, you know, he was just Jake, you know, Jake and everybody here. And he used to go with me, he'd take me to Frisco, Frisco. he'd take me to uh, Las Vegas, different place, and work in my corner. And I, he said, you ain't making no money. I just like to come here because Jake had money, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I love Jake for that. He was a comedian, and he was a good gentleman. He put his words in a respectful place for me. Talk with a lot of guys, he kid with you, bend his finger. I can still see him sitting in the back of the Olympic Auditorium with a cigar in his mouth, shaking hands with me, and he had a trick where he used to, because he was an old wrestler, he could take my thumb, and I'm a big man, I'm 6'3", 240, he could make a little kid out of me. Do you have some questions? All you gotta do is just relax and you know. Now settle down a little bit. Stop running so much, settle down a little bit. One of the greatest experiences I experienced in the ring was when I heard my first knockout. I weighed like at that time I weighed about 178 pounds. I was fighting a guy who weighed about 210 to 215, and uh, he's a strong guy, man. He was really bearing down hard on me, and I remember I hit him with a left hook, hit him with a, I jabbed at him, and I hooked off the jab and crossed the right hand and knocked him out. It took him 10 minutes before they could wake him up, and that was satisfying. Most of the satisfied was a little kid back in Chicago. He was named Wes Mola. That was one of my toughest fight. You know, that's hard, the hardest I've been hit. But I knocked him out in two rounds, you know. But, you know, I was hit so hard at that time, I didn't remember the fight. I was an aggressive, uh, step fighter. I, I never went back. I always went forward to, to my opponent, you know. And um, I fight in, in close to the side. But uh, I, all around, I, was, I was a pretty good boxer, along with, with a puncher. My style is like Ruben Olivares style, like a Turo Hernandez style, you know? It's like this, you know? Cover his, his, cover his, his chin, his face, you know? Like that, always. Not like this. I don't like that kind of style. I, want, I like see, but I don't want to, my fight because it's easy to hit, you know? Him Rumstrong style with the pitch and commotion style. He always tried to give me that style. But I was a boxer puncher. And I couldn't, you know, I had I could do it halfway good, but I didn't get it quite pet like Henry had, you know? Because Henry could throw punches all day long and never get tired. And so, but you know, I stayed in shape, but I wasn't in the kind of shape that Henry was in. Because Henry was a great, great one of the greatest fighters that I should ever live. You know, him, Sugar Ray Robinson, Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciana. But with him, I just couldn't make no money with him. I fought fighters, tough fights, tough fights. Like Louis Molina, when I beat Louis Molina, boom, in San Jose there, I beat him. I walked out there, he was number two in the world. I walked out with $200 in my pocket. $200 fighting the number two man in the world.
I just, I started partying, you know, for partying, I think that messed me up. When you're partying before fights and you think you're gonna be in shape, you know, it, it goes, you live it over the women running around the streets, you know. Man, I, man, I've been in and out of boxing so much. See, you gotta, see, you gotta understand. I had a twelve year, I had a twelve year leave of absence from boxing. For twelve years, I was through. I, I, didn't, I didn't go. I, I was through with boxing. I mean, I come in the gym from time to time, work out, and see what's going on. But that was basically it. You know, I get sick, and I lose everything. Lose my boxing gym, everything. But now I come again, trying to survive in boxing. But it's hard. It's hard in boxing to survive. Things happen to you in your life. And God has a way of making you listen. My, this, this whole, like I tell you, this whole thing came about because I, I asked God that you can have boxing. And man, I was relieved to be through with boxing because I've been trying to make comebacks for years and always I let something pull me away. And I was content to say, God, you can have this. And it's, and it's like when I gave it to him, that's when things got better. For four months, I didn't think about boxing, didn't go near a gym, they, 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 they wouldn't pick up a boxing magazine, we didn't watch a fight on television. That's how through with boxing I was. And when it's like when I gave it to him, he just gave it right back. Like it's, it's, it's like he's been trying to say all this time, I just want to see do you love me enough to, get, to, to bless me anyway. If I don't make you a champion, do you love me anyway? If I don't make you uh, the richest man in the world, will you bless me anyway? I, I guess he just wanted to see where I was coming from. Because as soon as I, as soon as I loved him enough to give it to him, as soon, soon as I loved him enough to walk away from it, he just gave it back. And the future, the future's bright. And you're going to be taken. You can believe that you want to. They're going to take you in this game. This can be one of the worst games that you come down through. It can be one of the beautiful games to come down through. But you got to watch, you got to watch them. You got to watch these the matches these days. You got to watch them. You got to keep eyes on them, you know. And so, you know, I don't believe in nobody fighting that getting in there, fighting for his life, anything happened to him, then walk out, the mansion took all their money. Oh, man, you own for this, you own for that. And everything he done bought him, he done went up three times more than it cost. So I started drinking my booze, you know, and they got this hurt me. So I started drinking alcohol before fights. Yeah. So I lost my zip, my zip, my zip, my fast and my sharpness. And I was all about my defense, my entire defense. Then I lost about four fights after that. But they're all top notch contenders that I fought. Before I died, I want to get some few, at least I want world champion. Take care of myself, you know. Teaching what I know. Because I have a lot of experience to, to work out with some boxer, but now I, I just. Just trying again. I'm not teaching him to fight like I fought. I'm teaching him to fight so like a Henry Armstrong. I got him on a Henry Armstrong style. You know, he's strong, boy. He can bob him weed real good, you know. And so I got him down fighting the pitch motions, the pitch and commotion style. So I you know. I'm hope. One day he'd be, get close to Henry Armstrong. That would be hard to do, you know? But you never know when they, they say they, they marry or they, they get tired and they run away from you. What about your time? Your time, wait, wait, wait. To the end, they run away from you. One, one guy was coming in one day and he was telling me about a lot of the different guys that's got, got this going on, got that going on. And he got angry with me, man, because I told him I was successful. I said, look, man, how, how can you tell me that I'm not successful? I was down and out, living on the streets like an animal, like a dog, sleeping in cars at night, acting a fool, chasing a woman from corner to corner that was struck out on drugs. And now I, I went from uh, living like that to having hope, to having a purpose in life. How are you gonna tell me I'm not successful? I am successful. And it's like, that's the way I think and that's how I feel. So it looks like God just keeps blessing me more and more every day because I feel that way and I think that way. I'm not, I'm not gonna let nobody else determine my success. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna let nobody else tell me what it, what, it takes, what, it uh, what it takes to be successful. No, I'm successful because of where I've come from, because of the fact I got the hearts, the guts, and the determination to keep on turning. When, when, when I could just either just sit the hell with it all. But I got the heart, the determination, and the willpower, and the perseverance to keep going because I know as long as I keep going, something good gonna happen.
We had a wonderful time there. I, I enjoyed myself there. 